when we've got abundance, there's opportunity. If we don't have a healthy functioning soil, we don't have grass, we don't have cattle, we don't make any money. We're seeing some extraordinary gains in our soil organic carbon here at Wilmot. That soil organic carbon will stay in our soil. At a very macro level, this is our contribution to climate change. This is our contribution to taking carbon out of the atmosphere, reducing emissions and, and putting it in our soil. Hi, I'm Ellie. And I'm Susie. And you're listening to Soils for Life. Each episode, we're bringing you stories about soil, the opportunities in the ground and the challenges above it. So what's the opportunity we're exploring first? Well, we just published a great case study on Wilmot Cattle Co. And one of the interesting things about that case study was that they managed to negotiate a pretty big deal with Microsoft to pay them to sequester soil carbon on their property. And we've assembled a great cast of players to tell us all about the complexities and the intricacies and the state of play for soil carbon right now in Australia. And there are a lot of people involved to make it work. But first up, let's hear from cattle producer Craig Carter, who's been a pioneer in this space. Quick plug, Craig Carter was also one of Soils for Life's case studies. And if you want to find out more, we'll have a link to his case study in the show notes. Craig Carter, I'm from Tallawang, up on the foothills of the Liverpool Ranges which is some of the most fertile country in Australia. It's all basalt soils. We run a beef cattle breeding and trading operation. And we are, or I am, fairly focused in trying to restore the landscape function that was here when the first white squatters came across the range. And this place was pretty run down when we bought it. You know, there were big dead old grass butts of plains grass which were you know eight foot tall and about two foot six diameter and dead and lignified and now I'm looking out at the same place now and the plains grass butts are about that diameter which is about eight inches they're probably less than knee high and they've got 500 odd heifers on four hectares. Every plant on this planet needs five things It's their perfect recipe. You know, if they've got all these in alignment, they'll prosper. And that's soil temperature, air temperature, photo period, moisture, and soil health. And you can only manage one of those, soil health. You've got to have diversity of plants. The greater diversity of plants doesn't matter whether they're pollinator attractors, whether they're medicinal plants, whether they're herbs, whether they're legumes, whether they're forbs, whether they're grasses. Grasses are simple. You know, we want complexity. And in that complexity, we then get a greater diversity of root structures in the ground. So everything from a tillage radish that'll grow, you know, as big as your leg to something that's got little tiny fine root hairs and fungal relationships that go for miles. So looking at soil organic matter as being a building block to improving my overall soil health, because for every 1%, I increase my organic matter in my soil. I store around about 220,000 litres for every 1%. There's one of the benefits that we're getting. Now, I didn't discover this till I was talking with Susan Orgel. She's a great communicator on this. And I watched her give a presentation a couple of months ago and I just walked up to her afterwards and I said, what's the, you know, sort of, you know, I'm only a farmer. What's the relationship between cation exchange capacity and organic matter? And she said, it's linear. Put simply, cation exchange capacity is the ability of nutrients and trace elements to flow between soils and plants. And the more organic matter you have, the better the flow. Craig also started to look at the link between soil organic matter and soil carbon and realised that cation exchange capacity is a useful proxy for measuring all the good things we want to achieve with soils. And when Craig met Dr Susan Orgill, who's a scientist with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, he talked about what sort of a goal he could set for this important metric. And she started talking about, oh, well, you can move it from 20 to 30. And I said, yeah, OK, um, we're starting at 55 and up to 70, depending on which paddock you're in. And she just looked at me and said, well, I have seen it up to 230 or 240. So there's a goal, you know, like, let's go for that. But there's a lot of complexity involved in getting there. So soil organic matter is crucial to restoring landscape function and more soil organic matter 
means more soil carbon. But what's actually happening under the soil surface to build up soil carbon in our agricultural landscapes? Well, Dr Orgel's message is that it's all about trying to tip the natural balance in favour of building carbon. It's a bit of a balance. It's a balance between how much organic matter goes into the soil. So either through photosynthesis, so boosting plant growth on site, or organic matter that we bring to the site in terms of things like manure or biochar or composts and products like that. And then the offset of that is carbon loss from the site through decomposition and through erosion. So pretty much what you see happen above ground in terms of plant growth can happen below ground in those carbon stocks. But I guess the bigger the bucket you have of soil organic matter, the more resilient those systems are. So that fluctuation actually becomes less with time and your systems will hold on for longer and respond more rapidly when conditions do become favourable. Susan went on to tell us about all the different strategies that farmers are employing to increase carbon in their soils. So practices which boost plant growth are really consistent with good agronomy in terms of overcoming plant constraints. So if it's an acidic soil, if it's a sodic soil, so management practices which overcome those constraints, making sure that plants have adequate plant nutrition. So they've got all the nutrients that they require to grow big and healthy. And then there's things around if it's a pasture, I think grazing management is absolutely king. So thinking about the timing and the time that a pasture is grazed, legume components in pastures, as I said before, soil organic matter It's 58% carbon, but it's also other nutrients. And one of those other really important nutrients is nitrogen. So having legumes in your pastures is a really important way to build up soil organic matter as well. With cropping systems, the most readily influenced part of the cropping system is the pasture phase. So making sure that we've got perennial pastures or legumes in there which can build up organic matter and nitrogen through that pasture phase but also looking at minimizing the loss of organic matter from those systems so minimizing tillage retaining crop stubble and residues as well and then just generally it's as I said before it's about kind of making sure we're on top of plant nutrition in some cases I think some of the biggest changes in soil organic carbon levels come through a change in land use or practice so if we've got a degraded cropping paddock moving that to a permanent perennial pasture you can get a big change in soil organic carbon then there's that like the new exciting stuff where research is happening in terms of mixed species plantings and biostimulants and microbes which specifically stabilize carbon as well so there's the on-farm benefits in terms of increasing things like water holding capacity nutrient supply buffering changes in soil conditions, so things like soil temperature and soil pH, making more soil, so actually growing soil, and then lessening some of the biotic pressures that crops and pastures will be susceptible for. So they're like the on-farm benefits, and there's like a real productivity cash benefit of those. I live in the food bowl of New South Wales, if not Australia, with Liverpool Plains. The majority of Australian agriculture is extensive, it's operating on grasslands. Those grasslands are capable of putting carbon away and I'd like to see that happen. I'd like to see a lot of our agricultural community working back towards rehydrating their their landscape. And this is a function of building your organic matter, which is what I've been trying to do here. We're looking after our landscape. increasing the biodiversity of our landscape. We're making and redeveloping the complexity that Mother Nature likes to have. And then I started to analyse the social good issues. Is there a social good with soil carbon? And there is. We've got retained water, we've got improved water quality, we're taking carbon dioxide out of the air. Maybe we should be able to be rewarded for that as an addition to what else we're doing. And there are various opportunities to be rewarded for building soil carbon on farms. Anthony Benny from the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment is involved with the development of the federal government's publicly funded carbon scheme and sees growing interest in the sector. I've been dabbling in this climate land sector space for a bit over 13 years now. 
And if I turn my mind back to where we were back then, I don't think I would have realised how far we have progressed. And the fact that people are talking about these kind of opportunities in soils and developing standards for measuring biodiversity across different landscapes and different environments. And we have the banks and institutions and financiers that are looking to buy this is demonstrating that people are increasing their, I suppose, confidence in these markets, but they will continue to develop and improve over time and certainly um, the discussions we've had with uh, various private sector players they are uh, certainly very keen and very interested and they're coming to the table with money to buy these kind of outcomes. So there's money on the table from both government and the private sector but how can farmers access it? Well Craig was one of the first farmers to try to go through the process for generating government verified soil carbon credits and even though he has a background in financial markets It wasn't all smooth sailing. My primary academic qualification, I suppose, is a Masters of Applied Finance. For my sins, I'd sort of traded in futures, foreign exchange, money market derivatives. I did spend a significant chunk of my life involved in financial markets, which is part of this carbon discussion. Because we were almost at the bleeding edge of it, the process was very, very early stage The methodology was put in place and we're sort of sitting around going, oh, yeah, let's go and play, but we're not really sure what the rules are. And I don't think anyone was. And we're now sort of, in hindsight, kind of going, yeah, well, I should have done that better there and I should have done that better there. And that's a lot of that's documentation. And there's sort of not really a procedures manual for... The process and the simple stuff is what people want. They want something to be really simple and easy so therefore they've only got to do one thing and that works. Mother Nature is very complex. We really don't understand all the implications of everything that we do so therefore you've got you're doing a lot of experimental work as you're just touching things and just you know did that work and if I do more of it will it work better or does it actually make it worse and that's where a procedures manual is really good in a complicated situation. So you give someone the manual and say, just go through and tick all the boxes and you'll be right. So that's probably what was lacking. And I think, you know, they're getting there. Craig's saying that the process of trying to build soil carbon is complex because it involves working with natural systems, which are complex. There's experimentation involved, the outcomes are uncertain, and he was concerned that the process for accessing soil carbon payments was adding further administrative complexity on top of that. Complexity on top of complexity on top of complexity meant many farmers just wouldn't bother. So why is it so complicated to qualify for soil carbon credits? Well, with complexity comes risk. So to discuss the risks involved, I spoke to Michael Crawford from the Soil CRC. If there is that sort of complexity, there's also a lot of risk involved in different parts of that system. The issue is that we're dealing with a product, if you like, soil carbon, that is quite heterogeneous in the landscape. It it varies in its uh, concentrations and its amount from hectare to hectare, from metre to metre, from centimetre to centimetre. And it varies in time as well. Uh, It can go up, it can go down. Uh, it's a biologically mediated activity that we're talking about here. And you can't see it. Unlike trees or vegetation that exists above ground, where you can say, yep, there's a forest, there's X tons of carbon sitting in those logs there. You can't see it. So it's how we measure it and how we do that in a way that gives confidence to the markets at a price. You know, it doesn't cost so much to make the whole business uneconomic. Michael's saying that there's a reason the process is complex. It's because there are risks and they need to be managed. But then what are the options for farmers? One option that Craig decided to take is to sign up with the carbon project developer, but he didn't start out that way. Someone who registered in his own right because he was kind of going, these leading project developers, you know, they just want to eat all your lunch. And then a colleague of mine, she said, I've got, I'm just working with some people. Do you mind if I bring them to Talawang to have a look at what you're doing, how you're doing it, why you're doing it? And lo and behold, I end up with about 10 for lunch. And then, you know, we're out in the paddock and the joint CEOs and a couple of the others and all that sort of thing. We then sat down and had some serious discussion because I was getting to the point where I was getting so frustrated with dealing with the complications that are involved in the project. And they said, look, do you want us to act for you? Sure. Sure. 
So that's why I'm working with them. They're finding their knowledge of the methodology, their knowledge of the act is such that they're finding wrinkles or sorting out wrinkles that I would have just gone nut too hard. So that's great. And they're also coaching me through the process, which is good. So my standing line to anybody now is don't try and do it on your own. At this point, it's really important to say that while Craig's had a good experience so far, we have heard reports of not so good experiences with carbon project developers. So it's really important that farmers choose carefully. Hi, I'm Sky Glende from Climate Friendly. The people that we partner with, their main passion is managing the land and improving their country and delivering sustainable agricultural products. And what we do is help them to access new revenue sources that can accelerate that and also help to tackle climate change along the way. So Sky, tell us what the biggest challenges are to getting more farmers involved in soil carbon projects. Is it the transaction costs? Some of the challenges are around all the transaction costs associated with that verification of carbon. So you need to do at least three audits in the life of a project, but you also need to report and have that verified by the regulator every time you want carbon credits. That's quite a high cost to have that sort of independent report and verification. And for a smaller parcel of land, that can be an immediate barrier to making it commercially viable for them to participate. A second big set of costs is around the field measurement. So right now, the way that the soil carbon methods have worked, you need to go out and take field measurements or soil cores at a depth of about a metre in order to uh, submit your reports. And you need to take quite a number of those across your property to make sure you have a sufficient sample size. That's very costly, particularly as the size of a property increase, but, but even on a smaller property, a smaller property would generate less carbon credits. So it's still the cost per hectare is often prohibitive and a lot of landholders have been asked to pay that up front, which makes it really hard for them to get involved. And those two big costs, along with a slightly lower carbon price, um, at the moment, the EU, the US, New Zealand all have substantially higher carbon prices than Australia. Uh, so those factors combined have made it really challenging. So why is it so expensive to measure soil carbon? The way in which we do measure carbon has a lot of variability. And so when measuring soil carbon, you can get a lot of noise, a lot of you know, some plus or minus quite, quite large amounts to actually detect significant differences over time. It can be quite an issue. I'd last year when I was speaking with someone in a major um, retail organisation who's interested in the soil carbon market. He's coming from a financial background. And we're talking about what we might do and where some of the increases in soil carbon might come from. And his question was to me, so how much will soil carbon change on a quarterly basis. He's thinking about every three months. And so I had to explain to him that we're not talking about financial markets and dollars, but profit and loss systems. We're talking about soil carbon to actually measure detectable changes in a statistically confident way can take quite a few years. Michael's point is that it's expensive to measure soil carbon because it's hard to do it properly. Yeah, and as Anthony Benny told us, it's crucial that we do it properly. People from the private sector want to understand how a market works before they start putting money into it. So ultimately, if the science isn't there to demonstrate these are real outcomes, then it's very hard for a market to value it and for that to transition to a larger market opportunity. So I think it's continuing to develop and will continue to grow, but having the confidence from the science that these kind of products are real integrity in the systems that are put in place so having the likes of the clean energy regulator manage these things that provides that integrity and the underlying legislation that provides that market confidence so basically if we don't have a credible system for measuring carbon the money won't flow so what can be done to reduce the cost well sky glenday wants governments to change two things about the regulation of carbon markets so at the moment, if you register a project, you need to have at least three independent audits across the life of it, and they're quite a high cost process. It means that you need to have a fairly large project to make it viable. A lot of the land parcels in Australia, particularly in the productive ag areas, are much smaller land parcels. So we've got a large number of smaller land parcels, and on their own, they couldn't generate enough carbon to fund those audit costs. What we're trying to do is flip that. Normally when we're providing services, we're automating processes, trying to drive down costs so that we can provide a much larger number of farmers uh, with the right maps to manage their property, with the right abatement information, 
um, and we're really setting up a very systemic way of providing them the information they need to do a carbon project. That means our processes could be audited instead of each single project being audited. And that means we could offer a much larger number of farmers services at a much lower price. And that takes away that barrier. It's very similar to what we already do in other sectors like the financial sector, where we audit our tax return every year. Instead of auditing every single invoice, you audit the system and then you spot check invoices. So you don't lose integrity. You audit very robust systems and then you make sure that they're being implemented appropriately. So that's one big way that we could, we could really enable smaller landholders to participate at a much lower cost and, and to get high returns from their projects. So that's ask number one, shift from auditing every project to auditing the processes and then spot checking just a few projects. So Susie, what was Sky's second ask? Well, her second ask was around updating the soil carbon method to enable a combination of modelling and field measurement. So if we move to a soil carbon method that enabled modelling and a combination of field measurement instead of just pure field measurement, which is what we've got at the moment, it would unlock participation, it would reduce costs, but it would actually provide greater accuracy as well. So at the moment, you need to take soil cores across your property and depending on exactly where you end up placing the soil core, you can get some outlier measurements that maybe if you put the soil core 30 centimetres the other way, you'd get a different result. And that's just one of the challenges with taking a soil core. You can hit a rock, you can hit a patch that's just a little bit disparate to the normal average. And if anyone goes up and sort of digs their soil, they know there's slight variations across their property. So if you take field measurements, uh, one, it's high cost, and two, you have that problem that there's slight variations in sampling that can skew the results, uh, and that could be an up or down um, result that they might get more or less carbon abatement. If we use mapping, now we have quite amazing maps that you can get as much as weekly that show your pasture biomass, so your grass on the property, and that can be across every single hectare or, or in mapping terms every pixel of the property and show you what biomass pasture is there. That's quite a revelation for a few reasons. It can help a land manager real time to make a different management decision because they can see the pasture availability and they can decide to move their stock or change their practices in a quite quick time period after seeing that data set. It also gives us the best indication of what's going into the soil. So that's ask number two. Use new technology to reduce the need for expensive on-farm soil measurements. So Susie, what's the government doing about these? We asked the clean energy regulator that regulates the carbon market in Australia about whether it's planning to make these changes. I'm Conrad Muller. I'm from the Clean Energy Regulator. I work in the land, forest and blue carbon method development team. And I work particularly on soil carbon methods within that team and the development of the 2021 soil carbon method. So we've spent basically the last year developing this method. So the method is designed to reduce the cost of uh, measuring or estimating soil carbon down from around $30 a hectare to $3 a hectare. And one of the key ways of doing that is utilizing modeling to bring down the amount of sampling you need to do in order to estimate soil carbon. What we've been doing is building a sort of hybrid measure model measure framework where previously you had to take samples annually and, and every five years was, you can nominate um, how often you want to go out to your fields and sample. We've basically stretched that out to 10 years if you can provide model estimates in those in-between periods to estimate the change that's going along. And we allow groups of projects to sort of band together to use a model, you know, that's sort of called the validation group. And they can all use that model if a subset of those projects are, are sampled to verify that that model is, is performing adequately. There's a number of measures out that we're consulting on at the moment and have become available. For example, there's an advanced payment for soil carbon projects that was developed for the 2018 method, and it allows a set amount of, of an abatement contract to be paid upfront for projects to cover their soil carbon accounting costs. So that's a, one of those measures to, to reduce that initial cost of sampling. Okay, so 
the clean energy regulator's new soil carbon methodology is doing something to try to reduce costs for farmers by reducing the need for expensive on-ground soil measurements. Yes, and hopefully this will enable more farmers to access the scheme. But Sky also told us that the regulations don't work particularly well for mixed farming enterprises, who might want to make a range of management changes to build carbon across different parts of their farm. The other part is just that the rules or the method have been very prescriptive. In Australia, many properties are managed through, I guess, mixed farming enterprises. And the rules have typically been focused more on a one specific management change. And so that means you can't necessarily, say, plant a shelter belt and store carbon in your soil. You'd need to pick and you need to get both of them audited and both of them reported. And, and that just means the cost blowout and, and you can't get sufficient returns if the carbon price is too low. And that means people don't end up participating. The Clean Energy Regulator is apparently looking at this issue and others, but not yet proposing any changes. We don't charge fees for registration of projects. That's not an issue in itself. There's audit reports which need to be provided. Generally, you need to do at least three audits in in the course of a 25-year project, and those are done for each method. So if you had three methods on your property, you would need three audits. We are sort of looking uh, in terms of there's a method stacking work going on in terms of how, how we could facilitate it, but it's something that's currently not allowed for in, in the scheme. But, you know, we are conscious of that extra order cost that, that sort of comes along. We've also looked at a number of different ways because once you've had an increase in soil carbon, there is, of course, the question of, of what you do with those credits. And within the carbon market, there's a number of changes um, that we've recently introduced, for example, um, optional delivery contracts so that you can either sell to the Commonwealth or, or higher paying sellers who are after carbon credits, as well as an accu exchange coming up, which sort of applies more of a, a stock ASX kind of approach to the carbon market to make it easier to transact in accus. And there's also a number of pilot measures which aren't yet applied to soil carbon, but it's kind of a watch this space in, in terms of where we're looking at how we can reduce those sort of audit and insurance costs. Another big issue is what's called the risk of reversal. This means what happens if the soil carbon you build gets lost or reversed, for example, in a drought or a fire. Soil carbon can go up, it can also go down in a certain period of time. Who wears that risk? Are the sort of issues that need to be considered there? When you say that, it makes me think of the stock market. (laughs) Is that kind of how it works, that it can go up and it can go down? So you could actually end up with a loss if you're a farmer? Well, that all depends on the nature of the agreement that's been entered into. That's always saying, yeah, but you know, people need to be conscious of that, that yes, you can build soil carbon, but a change of management, a drought, a long period of dry conditions, a soil carbon can also disappear, can decrease. Those sort of factors need to be built into the arrangements. According to the Clean Energy Regulator, this is accounted for in various ways in the regulation. So if there's been a reversal of carbon, so that, assuming you want to stay in the scheme, maintain your activities, but there, there's been, say, a drought and your soil carbon stocks have gone down, there's often a view out there that you need to automatically relinquish credits if that occurs. And that, that, that's not the case on the scheme. There are exemptions. Say you do your baseline and you go into drought and it drops below your baseline levels. You don't need to relinquish for that because you haven't been credited anything. But once you've been credited and, and say there's a drought, then you know, you're exempt as long as you're taking reasonable steps to mitigate that reversal. And you know, that, that is an important part. However, if you just simply stopped your management activity, then you are not exempt from that. But it's very much a sort of case by case assessment. But th- there are those protections in there for landholders in the design of the scheme. Conrad's saying that there are exemptions for natural cycles like drought that might affect the levels of soil carbon that a farmer's managed to build up. And if an exemption is not available, the scheme provides various ways for farmers to transfer their carbon stocks. The credits are ultimately transferable. So if there has been an unmitigated reversal, say, you know, your, your farm forestry is burnt down, you're not replanting, for example, you could use soil carbon credits to exit that farm forestry method, for example. You know, that, that's the idea of credits. They are ultimately transferable and allow different people to, to be released from their obligations and Obviously, a diversity of projects means a diversity of sort of crediting incomes as well, which, which allows those things to sort of balance out. The new soil carbon methodology is out for public consultation at the moment, 
and submissions are closing soon on Monday the 27th of September. We definitely encourage anyone interested in this issue to have your say via the Clean Energy Regulators website and we'll put a link in the show notes to that website. After that consultation period closes, the regulator will update and finalise this new methodology. It's great to hear that progress is being made with the methodology. We also need to remember that there's inherent value in sequestering carbon in soils. Professor Richard Eckard from the University of Melbourne recently co-authored a paper for the Australian Farm Institute called A Landholder's Guide to Participate in Soil Carbon Farming. He brings some key data to the conversation. I think maybe we've gotten the ditch on focusing on the wrong outcome. Focusing on carbon credits from soil when in actual fact the productivity benefits of high soil organic matter are there staring at us. We ran a a few studies in Western Victoria around Hamilton versus Birchip, low rainfall, high rainfall type environments, where we showed that the just on two of the attributes that soil carbon can confer, namely water holding capacity and nitrogen mineralization potential, that if you take those two and put them together, there's about an extra 100 to $120 a hectare of productivity value from having high carbon in a pasture soil to low carbon in a pasture soil. Now, that's there already looking at you. And yet we focus on the 15 to $20 per hectare of carbon trading, carbon credit value in that soil. And I, I struggle to understand why that is more attractive than just banking the inherent productivity of having a more productive soil that's worth $100 to $150 of productivity per hectare. Often the barrier to people making these practice changes is they they don't have the finances to invest. So part of why we think the carbon farming side is so important is it's a new way to diversify income and give landholders the resources that they need to make some of those changes to improve their practices. That could be quite expensive. And if you have carbon money that can support that change, then you'll have higher agricultural production through your grazing. You'll have healthier soils, better water holding capacity. It can cope with drought. So it really is a win-win, but it's a catalyst for change. And then the biggest problem is normally having the finances to invest in that practice change. From a a source CRC perspective, right from the start, we've had a a very strong interest in in undertaking research that gives farmers the the tools, the knowledge, means by which they can sequester their carbon. Not just for the purpose of being able to sequester carbon and benefit from carbon sequestration markets, but because it's about building organic matter in the soil. And organic matter in the soil delivers a whole range of benefits, including improved soil structure, improved water holding capacity, water infiltration, soil biological activity, nutrient dynamics. And all those factors in turn help to improve the productivity of the farming enterprise and ultimately the, uh, the profitability. So sequestering soil carbon, building soil organic matter, improving soil health, is good for farming business. Now, if we can help to incentivize farmers by being rewarded for soil carbon sequestration, then that's an added bonus. And in turn, help them to compensate for some of the extra costs that might be involved in places, or be, as I said, incentivized, rewarded, motivated to undertake practices that's not just good for their farming business, but helps to draw down carbon out of the atmosphere and for the benefit of everybody. So we do have a carbon project in place and the sampling we did 10 days ago is our first round after baseline and that's why I'm sort of chewing on my fingernails because hopefully there's going to be a few ACUs, ACCUs created and stuck in an account with my name on it or the company's name. It could be really handy, it'd be nice. Probably a good subsidiary income or a good second string to your bow. The other thing too is that If it motivates people to take on the form of agriculture that's going to create carbon in the soil, all happy days, because we're going to then end up heading towards my my vision for Australian agriculture. And how much we can do, it's all about mindset. If you want to make change and you've got a, a vision for where you want that change to take you, you'll get there. I love Craig's whole story because he doesn't shy away from the challenges and the complexities. I love how he brought it back to shifting your mindset 
because that's where change really begins. Yeah, and I'm really keen to hear what Souls for Life CEO Liz Clark has to say about it. Hey, Liz. Hey, Ellie. So, Liz, I'm interested in what are the biggest things that you took away from this episode? You've covered a lot in there. A lot of complexity on complexity on complexity, as you say. There's three things that we need to keep in mind. One is not stifling innovation. The second thing is diversity. Maintaining diversity is absolutely key in farming systems if we're going to rebuild soils. The third point, which is a really important point that at Source for Life we highlight in our case studies, is adaptability. The farmers that we're working with are highly adaptive to increasing climate variability, adaptive to unpredictable and variable markets. And these programs need to ensure they keep that in mind, that that adaptability is encouraged and enabled and not inhibited. The carbon market can really be of help to farmers in terms of rebuilding their systems. But we do need to remember that the end game is healthy soils, not the market itself. The market is a means to that end and a very important one. This podcast has been produced by the Grow Love Project in collaboration with Soils for Life and is supported through funding from the Australian Government's National Landcare Program. The episode was mixed and edited by Edgar Sgreste and we'd like to thank all our guests for their time and insights. For more information, check out the links in the show notes, sign up to the Soils for Life newsletter and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Thanks so much for listening.